The Triassic period, as many of you will know of, was a time of evolutionary experimentation and a time brought about by the largest mass extinction event of all time, allowing for a great variety of animals to fill in the niches that were now vacant. One group of archosaurs, now known as dinosaurs, attempted this, and while they were not the most dominant group of the time, another incoming extinction event was soon to expand this. One of the most notable of these animals during the period was Coelophysis, a fairly typical dinosaur that today is one of the quintessential Triassic animals, with its copious fossil record and simplistic body plan typical of the time, and essentially being a blueprint that future lineages would build on. The first bones of these animals were found by amateur fossil collector David Baldwin in 1881 in the Chinle Formation in northwestern New Mexico, who worked for Edward Trinker Cope, a key player in the now infamous Bone Wars. Cope described the species in 1887, however, he originally named the remains as the species of Salurus instead, which through numerous more revisions, he eventually referred to the material two years later as Coelophysis borei as the type species, after the comparative anatomist George Barr, whose ideas were similar to Cope. The name comes from the Greek words of hollow and form, thus hollow form in a reference to its vertebrae, although these first finds were too poorly preserved to give a complete picture of this new genus. This was later changed with the incredible discovery of a substantial graveyard of fossils found by George Whitaker at the Ghost Ranch in New Mexico in 1947. The specimens, over a thousand of which, were so numerous, well preserved and articulated that one of them has since become the diagnostic or type specimen for the entire genus, replacing the original poorly preserved specimen Cope had described. These remains suggested to some that this was evidence of group behaviour, which after this remark has produced many depictions of these animals in art and documentaries in massive groups. Despite this, no direct evidence for flocking however exists, as the deposits only indicate that large numbers of Coelophysis, along with other Triassic animals, were buried together. Some of the evidence from the taphonomy of the site indicates that these animals may have instead gathered together to feed or drink from a depleted waterhole, or to feed on a spawning run of fish, and then became buried in a catastrophic flash flood or a drought. Although it could also be that floodwaters picked up and drowned animals across a large distance until they were eventually deposited. This is supported by evidence that as Ghost Ranch was close to the equator at the time of these animals, it has a warm, monsoon-like climate with heavy seasonal precipitation in a floodplain-like environment with distinct wet and dry seasons. Furthermore, it seems like flooding from these monsoons was commonplace in the late Triassic, as a site from the nearby petrified forest of Arizona preserves log jams of tree trunks caught in one such flood. From this, it seems as if the carcasses from these animals ended up blocking up a small channel and later became buried by silt. In terms of the animals themselves, they were small, slenderly built carnivores that could grow up to 3 meters long and between 15 and 20 kilograms in weight. Despite being quite a basal dinosaur given the time period they were from and how they would have appeared in life, they were already more derived from animals like Herrerasaurus and Eoraptor. As an example, while the torso conformed to the basic theropod body shape, the pectoral girdle displayed some interesting characteristics for this apparently basal genus. Coelophysis specimens have been found with a furcula, otherwise known as a wishbone, being the earliest known example in a dinosaur. Due to the exceptional preservation and age range of the specimens found at the ranch, it means that these relatively typical theropods are among some of the best known of all genera. It has been found that many of these remains could be subdivided into robust and grey cell forms, and it has been thought that these represent male and female animals, although this has been debated. Gracile forms possess longer skulls, necks, shorter forelimbs, as well as the sacral neural spines being fused, with the robust forms having shorter skulls, necks, longer forelimbs, and unfused sacral neural spines. This has been interpreted by some as possible sexual dimorphism, with one study finding that the two morphs were present even in juvenile specimens, suggesting that these differences were present early in life and prior to sexual maturity. This study, conducted by Larry Reinhardt, concluded that the gracile form was female and that the robust form was male based on differences in the sacral vertebrae, which in the gracile forms would have allowed for greater flexibility for egg laying. There was also evidence that each morph comprised 50% of the population assessed, as would be expected in a 50-50 sex ratio. Ontogenic growth of the genus gathered using data gathered from the length of the femur concluded that juveniles grew rapidly, especially during the first year of life, likely reaching sexual maturity between the second and third year of life. 
also identifying four distinct growth stages at one, two, four, and seven years of age. More recent research has found that coelophysis had highly variable growth rates between individuals, with some specimens being larger in their immature phase than smaller adults when completely mature, with some interpreting the distinct morphs as the result of individual variation, although the clear skeletal differences are still apparent. Animals also possess long and narrow heads, with large, forward-facing eyes that would have afforded them stereoscopic vision and excellent depth perception. A sclerotic ring found for juvenile coelophysis was compared to data on the rings of other reptiles and birds, and concluded that they would have been diurnal, visually oriented animals, with the study finding that their vision was likely superior to most lizards, and was comparable to modern birds of prey. A study also examined the biomechanics of theropod forelimbs, including coelophysis, and evaluated their usefulness in predation, finding that their forelimbs were flexible and had a good range of motion, but that their bone structure suggested that they were comparatively weak. The weak forelimbs and small teeth in the genus suggest that they preyed upon animals that were substantially smaller than themselves. Relating to this is the popular idea that they were cannibalistic, which although being something common in many animals, would still be a fascinating insight to gleam from these long extinct animals. This was first identified in 1947, where preparation of two of the more complete skeletons found at Ghost Ranch revealed aggregations of small archosaurian reptile bones that appeared to lie within the dinosaur's body cavities. Without specific justification, these remains were thought to represent juvenile coelophysis, and that they were unequivocal evidence for dinosaurian cannibalism, an anecdote that many museum exhibits, books, and popular press have referred to. A detailed study looked into the validity of these claims, finding that while there were indeed animals positioned in the body cavity, they could be explained differently. The well-preserved remains consisting of the left and right proximal ends of femora, a left ilium and a sacral vertebra within the stomach cavity assisted in the identification, and comparative morphology found that the bones lacked any synapomorphies with coelophysis, theropoda, or even dinosauria, instead being consistent with crocodilomorpha. For instance, the left ilium bears a closed acetabulum, which nearly all dinosaurs, including coelophysis, lacked, instead possessing an open one. The sacral vertebra also shows no indications of fusion with surrounding vertebrae, as well as having an anteroposteriorly short, dorsally expanded neural spine, and a sacral rib articulating to the centre of the centrum, all characters consistent with crocodilomorphs but not with coelophysis. Additionally, the femora lack the typical dinosaurian offset femoral head, anterior trochanter, and well-developed articular facets for the antitrochanter, all in all showing nearly identical histological patterning and structure. An animal this is comparable to is the common Hesperosuchus, also found in the same formation as coelophysis. So while this is not a case of cannibalism, it does give insight into what animals they were preying on. There are also other instances of remains being attributed to cannibalism, including tooth and jaw fragments of another specimen that has been considered morphologically identical to a juvenile coelophysis in regurgitate material, as well as bones within the thoracic cavity of another specimen, which were later found to be deposited stratigraphically below the larger animal that had supposedly cannibalized them. Coelophysis as a genus has also had a tumultuous taxonomic history, with there being multiple genuses and species being considered either invalid or absorbed into the genus, although two cases may just be distinct. The first of these is the genus and species C. rhodesiensis, known from the early Jurassic of southern Africa, having been first described by paleontologist Michael Rath in 1969, under the type genus Syntarsus, which was then later applied to a North American animal that will be talked about soon. However, the naming of Syntarsus, meaning together ankle, in a reference to where the distal fibula fused to its distal tibia, was found to be an invalid one, as the name was already taken by Colydina beetle, which had been described a century earlier. Because of this, the genus of Syntarsus was removed from use, with it being renamed by three entomologists who replaced it with the controversial name of Megapnosaurus, literally meaning Big Dead Lizard. This is controversial for three main reasons among paleontologists, first of all being that the authors were entomologists who published their findings in an entomological journal, second is that the etymology of the name was intended as a joke that now remains as a formal name, 
And third was that it was alleged that the authors had neglected to contact Rath to get his input on the matter. The first two complaints, however, are completely unwarranted, as those who discovered the homonymy and had previously published on the Beetle Syntarsis should be able to choose the replacement name in calling the issue out, and the venue is likewise appropriate, given that since it is a peer-reviewed journal focused on insect taxonomy, the preoccupation of Syntarsis is a relevant issue, and should be resolved. Humorous names are also not uncommon in zoological nomenclature, and nor are they usually considered problematic. And as for the third complaint, the authors on the renaming had attempted to contact Rath, but were unsuccessful in doing so, presuming that he was deceased in the process. However, Rath was indeed very much alive, and would later consider that Megapnosaurus was itself not valid, instead considering it as a synonym to the earlier named Coelophysis due to the close resemblance they shared. The first to lump the two together was Greg Paul, who has become infamous for lumping genera without much solid reasoning or consistency, which was supported by Rath and others mainly to avoid using the name of Megapnosaurus, which they considered to be unethically named, with the Wikipedia page for these animals favouring this claim. However, there is indeed a fair amount of evidence that does imply Megapnosaurus was indeed a distinct genus, and while they are small, it is enough to split them. Megapnosaurus differs from Coelophysis in cervical length, proximal and distal hind limb proportions, as well as proximal caudal vertebral anatomy, as well as Coelophysis lacking a pit at the base of the premaxilla, and also that they had a longer maxillary tooth row. More recent studies have also clarified the anatomical characters that differ between these two genuses, with one of the most notable being that Megapnosaurus lacks a vestigial fifth metacarpal, which is present in Coelophysis. Other basal theropods like Eodromius and Dilophosaurus retain this fifth metacarpal, suggesting that Megapnosaurus lost it independently, with current phylogenetic studies recovering M. rosiensis in a clade with Segesaurus and Camposaurus, with C. bowery being the sister taxon to Lepidus. There is also the case of another genus lumped into Coelophysis as well, but that is now largely considered being Syntarsis Cayentitecae, distinct as well, but because of the now invalid name, the genus itself will need to be given a new one. This genus differs from the other two animals in the possession of a promaxillary fenestra that is more notched as well as notable nasal crests. This genus is also a more basal one according to recent phylogenetic analyses, although as a result of its complicated taxonomic history, there is often confusion on which species of Megapnosaurus is which and what genera they belong to, although clear differences in the skulls show firsthand how different they are. Because of this, these animals are in need of a new name, although whatever this will be has yet to be determined, as some still consider them conspecific in spite of much evidence supporting the claim. Another aspect of them, this time concerning their appearance, is the possibility that Coelophysis possessed filaments, which among the basal dinosaurs has proven to be controversial. A study done in 2020 utilised a biophysiological modelling software to investigate the metabolic function of Plateosaurus and Coelophysis during global greenhouse conditions, evaluating within six microclimate models that bound to environments during the Triassic where Coelophysis would have inhabited. The results found amongst fully grown prosauropods that they would have been heat stressed in open, hot environments and would have been restricted to cooler microclimates, such as dense forests of higher latitudes and elevations, in agreement with the fossil record and what may have contributed to the latitudinal gap in the prosauropod fossil record. When it comes to Coelophysis, the results of the paper found that smaller theropods like them would have needed partial to full epidermal insulation in temperate environments to survive based on a ratite like metabolism, which is the most likely for these animals. The presence of the variable depth density and distribution of epidermal insulation was not only allowed for a broader range of environmental tolerances, it also appears to be a physiological necessity for them, and like for most other small ornithoderans as they increase their resting metabolic rates above ancestral levels. This, coupled with wind factors, surface area and diets, coupled with their size, makes this more likely in turn, and makes these animals even more unique. Coelophysis is also notable for being the second dinosaur in space following Myasaurus, with a skull from the Carnegie Museum leaving the atmosphere on the Space Shuttle Endeavour mission on the 22nd of January 1998, as well as being designated as the official state fossil of New Mexico in 1981, now representing the Museum of Natural History there in the logo of the building. While Coelophysis is certainly not the most unique dinosaur, and especially not during the Triassic with all of the bizarre fauna, 
it still holds a special place in paleontology and its history, with debates on integument, cannibalism and dinosaur evolution, all including Coelophysis as a key example of such discussions. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.